Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas is an embarrassment, and he demeans the court. Those strong words are from CNN senior legal analyst Jeffrey Tubin. Jeff also writes for The New Yorker magazine, and his latest piece is about this. It has been exactly eight years since Clarence Thomas last posed a question during oral arguments. The other eight justices ask questions all the time of the lawyers who are presenting their cases to the court. It's how they figure out what the holes in the legal arguments might be. According to Jeff, this means Thomas is simply tuned out. So why do we hear so little about this in the press? Well, joining me now in Washington is Jeffrey Tubin, and here in New York, Jamal Green, a professor at Columbia Law School. Jeff, let me start with you. Why do you think we don't hear more in the press uh, from reporters other than you about this lack of questioning from Clarence Thomas? Well, I think the people who cover the court take it for granted. And uh, it is true that Justice Thomas, he votes like the other justices. He writes opinions um, in the way the other justices do. He writes the same number, give or take. Uh, and th the oral argument is certainly not the most important part of being a Supreme Court justice, but it is an important part. And to me, not asking questions for eight years is simply a dereliction of his job, dereliction of his duties. In your column here, you've called it a, dis a disgrace. Well, because uh, the only public thing that Supreme Court justices do, other than render their opinions, is hear argument. And, you know, there, there's a reason why the phrase, your day in court, resonates for so many of us. Because, you know, when mm. you're in court, you expect that the judge will hear you out. The judge will engage with your lawyer. And if you think about nine justices behaving the way Thomas does, if you had nine justices who never asked questions, people would be outraged. And I think the fact that Thomas doesn't do it um, is something worthy of comment, and that's why I talked about it. Jamal, do you agree that if all nine acted this way, it would be newsworthy, but uh, it's not in this case? Well, I, I think it would be newsworthy if all nine acted this way, but that's in some ways exactly the point, is you've got 30 minutes to make oral argument at the court for each side gets about 30 minutes, and you've got eight other justices who are very active, who are asking questions, who are, um, in fact, in some ways asking too many questions, the lawyers can barely get a word in edgewise. And so I think there's actually something quite defensible about one of the justices simply saying, look, I'm going to listen to hear what the lawyers have to say. This is always a sensitive thing to bring up, but I, but I wonder, uh, do you think this has anything to do uh, with the fact that he's the only African-American on the Supreme Court? Is, that, is there some element of political correctness that leads this not to be talked about? Because when I read Jeff's New Yorker piece, I was shocked that it had been eight years since a question had been asked. So I, I don't really see it as being uh, any kind of political correctness. You know, I think the people who cover the court, as Jeff says, are aware of this and um, in some ways take it for granted. So right, it would be right. more of a story if he actually said something. It was interesting. It's something I didn't expect. Uh, this piece got a lot of attention, especially on social media. And a lot of conservatives who, of course, like Justice Thomas, accused me of racism in singling out Justice Thomas. I, I of course, don't buy that, but I thought... It, it was interesting about the sensitivity of these issues. I assure you, if there was some other justice, man, woman, white, black, who didn't ask questions for eight years, I would be talking about that justice too. But, you know, I, I was really struck by how that theme of how I was racially insensitive um, came up in social media uh, among mm. people who were criticizing me. I thought it was crazy, but, you know, everybody's entitled. You know, I do think that there's, as, as Jeff suggests, a bit of a racial subtext in the criticism of Justice Thomas for not speaking. Um, I don't think Jeff does this, but uh, I've certainly heard in talking to, um, to other law professors and the blogosphere and so forth, that people think that the reason he doesn't speak is because he's not bright enough um, to, to sort of engage in the colloquy with the other justices. Mm. And I think that's just not true. I mean, I've, I've met the man, he's a, he's a very bright man. Um, and, and he has said that others should take a cue from him, talk less and listen more. I, I think there's something to be said for that. You know the. The, the modern Supreme Court, where everyone is talking all the time um, and is extremely active, it's actually a fairly recent phenomenon, right? Really not until about the 1980s did we start to see the court get this active. You look back to the Warren Court, you look back to the 19th century, and you see benches that are totally silent, letting the, letting the lawyers say what they want. Mm. I'm not suggesting that that's the ideal, um, but uh, the notion that there's something that's not being said um, uh, on this Supreme Court strikes me as um, uh, uh, not very likely. I, I think Jamal really makes an ex excellent point there. And, you know, the, one of the reasons it's so 
outrageous, frankly, that Justice Thomas doesn't say anything, is that he has such a distinctive and important point of view on the law. He is by far the most conservative member of this court. He unfairly is criticized for you're just following along with Justice Scalia. That's not true at all. He's well more conservative than Justice Scalia, and it is worth, it would be worth letting the public hear that in, in the court arguments as well as in the written opinions. We're in the midst of one of these renewed pushes for cameras in the courtroom at the Supreme Court. Think that would affect, affect any of the dynamics we're describing here involving Justice Thomas? I think it might actually, because it's one thing to have a reporter like me write a column every once in a while saying Justice Thomas doesn't speak. But if you had cameras showing day after day, month after month, year after year, all the other justices talking and Thomas not talking, I think it would add to the pressure on him uh, to talk and add to the embarrassment. That's yet another reason why, unfortunately, I don't think there are going to be cameras in the courtroom uh, anytime soon. Jeffrey Tubin, Jamal Green, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. And before we go to break, one timely note about the Supreme Court. We were just talking about why there are no cameras in the highest court. Well, it turns out there was one, uh, very briefly. Look at this video, taken on the sly and uploaded to YouTube this week. No electronic devices are supposed to be allowed in the court, but a group that supports campaign finance reform snuck one in as a form of protest. All spectators are screened with magnetometers before entering, so it's not clear how they got away with it. But I, for one, am glad they did, because it's interesting to see even a very short glimpse inside that room.